This is Dr. Charles Parker, and you're listening to Core Brain Journal. It's a place where I connect both fresh discoveries and interesting different perspectives from advanced mind science with the realities of real people and everyday life down on Main Street. Well, welcome board folks, Dr. Charles Parker here one more time, and we have a very, very interesting guest. You know, you can't say that enough with these really cool people that I get a chance to talk to. And this gentleman today, Dr. David Magnano is going to join us, and he is going to tell us about fasting diet, the fast start diet. He's going to tell us how you can actually fast yourself into health. Now, people have been talking about this, and you may have heard a little bit about it, but it's high time for us here at Core Brain Journal to get down to the street level with the details of how this can help you with longevity, how it can help you with brain function. David, thank you so much for coming on board. We really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me. I love talking about this stuff. So <laughs> thanks well, for it's having gonna be, It's going to be a lot of fun because I know I'm going to enjoy talking to you and listening to you, really. So, folks, what we're going to do, first of all, is say a word from our sponsor, and then we'll come back and introduce David formally. So Core Brain Journal is sponsored by Great Plains Laboratory. They are deep international biomedical testing leaders for improved, targeted, mind science details. As both laboratory and webinar global thought leaders, they provide the most comprehensive set of hard data measurement tools for real biomedical answers beyond what's commonplace guesswork. They also provide multiple training webinars. This is an important point for both the public and people who want to get their medical providers on board on how to use this really interesting, I started to say cool, it is cool, cool data effectively. Check out their website for references and testing details. And this website I'm going to give you, they also are offering for our listeners here at Core Brain Journal a variety of different tests. They have a number of different tests available, including like the organic acid test that has like 72 specific testing answers from a simple urine sample. So why not go over and see what they have this week for offering and leave your name and see if you can get a drawing going for the test. And they'll also help you read the test and understand what it says. So go over to greatplainslaboratory.com, plural, plainslaboratory.com forward slash CBJ for Core Brain Journal. Why not give it a shot? You will be happy that you did because data is the new neuroscience foundation. So let me tell you a little bit about David and then we'll go ahead and and start the interview. He's a health educator and is one of the nation's top chiropractic physicians with more than 30 years of clinical practice. He's a highly popular speaker. I'm just talking to him for a couple seconds. I'm telling you, he's going to roll your socks up and down. He has designed and presented hundreds of wellness workshops for both patients and practitioners, wherein he's addressed a wide range of health issues. He can currently be heard on radio programs around the country in his capacity as the national spokesperson for the Fast Start Diet, which we're going to be talking about in great detail in just a moment. So first of all, let's run back, David, and get started with this whole fasting thing. I mean, you've been around the block clinically. How did you happen to get down and detailed with this Fast Start Diet? diet concept? Well, we've been doing weight loss at our clinics for a number of years, and it's always a challenge and it's always a struggle for patients. So we've just constantly been researching maybe the best ways to incorporate some healthy lifestyles with weight loss. So it's about two years ago, we started looking at fasting and it was becoming more and more popular. Not the old type of fasting where you go for days and days and days without eating. There's intermittent fasting where you can go for hours during the week or like a 12 or 16 hour gap between meals. And that's a type of fasting. There's three and five day fast where you are eating some food that takes all the risk and danger out of the fasting, but still gives you the benefits of fasting. So it basically just evolved through research and trial and error and working with patients and trying to find the simplest and most effective way to lose weight and improve somebody's health. As you're aware, and pretty much everybody's aware, we as Americans eat way too much food. Obesity is a problem. 
And it's very difficult to exercise the amount of calories that we normally eat now. The, and this is why everybody is overweight. So bringing that weight down is a very important thing. And this has been so effective, I think, because it's simple to do. And our compliance with patients has been very high, which then, of course, make the results fantastic, right? If they can stay with it, yeah, then that's good. Well, there are a couple of questions I want to ask you. I mean, it's just starting the conversation. One is, I'm really looking forward to hearing it about what you were, those introductory remarks. I would really be interested in you telling me and our listeners what the differences are between these different fasting diets. Why is one better than the other? Why is, what one do you like and why do you like it? Break down intermittent fasting from these longer fasts. That would be one question I'm really looking forward to. And the other question that's behind that is, can you compare and contrast, and I'll remember this question down the road, compare and contrast different types of diets in contradistinction to the fasting diet. So for example, the Mediterranean diet are the whole issue of the, what am I trying to say right now? The, the ketogenic diet. Tell yeah. us a little bit down the road, we'll ask you about those other diets. For right now, let's break down the different fasting diets if you don't mind. Okay. So basically on the broad spectrum, there's two types of fasting. There's long-term, which is sort of the old view to fasting, the old time fasting where you go for nine days or 12 days, you go for a number of days and you eat no food. You have water, but you eat no food. That is really not a very safe way to fast. It, uh, it puts a lot of stress on many of the systems within the body, and it's just not a good way. I mean, obviously, you will lose weight, though there is a point at that long-term fasting where you go into a starvation mode and you really start to hold on to the fat and things of that nature. So long-term fasting is not a plus at this point in time. The short-term fasting, there's basically two types of fasting that we consider short-term. There's the intermittent, which you can do on a daily basis, which is just not eating during a period of hours. That could be 12 to 16 hours, or you do a fast for three or four or five days where you're eating specific foods that have the ability to sort of trick your body into thinking that you're fasting. So you get the benefits of the fasting in addition to the weight loss. And the benefits that everybody agrees on, there's no question about this, is that when you fast, even if you fast 12 or 16 hours during a period of a day, and if you sleep for seven or eight hours, it's pretty easy to do that, to not eat maybe three or four hours before you go to bed, and when you get up in the morning, not eat for a couple of hours. So it's pretty easy to get that time frame in, but you definitely get a boost in metabolism. Everybody agrees on that. It does lower the risk for type 2 diabetes. Uh, it reduces some of the rust or stress, the oxidative stress in the body. It's better for cholesterol. It reduces cholesterol. And therefore, uh, fasting is considered to be good for cardiovascular diseases. It improves and increases the uh, getting rid of the dead cells in the body, an autophagy process, which is just really replacing or repairing the dead cells with functioning, normally functioning quality cells. Those things across the board, nobody disagrees with. And those are benefits that anybody could have, even if you didn't want to lose weight. In addition to that, because of the boost in the metabolism and these other benefits, everybody does lose weight. So those are really the two things. What we try to get our patients to do is start with the three-day fast. And we basically send them to faststartdiet.com. They buy a box of food that covers them for three days, soups and different proteins and uh, fats and oils that they're going to take during those three days. And that gets the whole fasting process started. And depending on how quickly they want to lose weight, we'll just have them miss meals during the week so they can get 12 or 14 or 16 hours of fasting, maybe several times a week to continue the weight loss and the other benefits that we already spoke about. So um, that's really the, the situation on fasting. The long-term fasting with no food Probably not the best thing. There's varied opinions about that, but it does put some stress on the body, and I would agree with that. But the short-term fasting, very powerful and really beneficial. I mean, they, they studied uh, laboratory animals, and they, they just had them fast every other day. They fed them every other day. Not that difficult of a thing to do, and they, they showed that those animals lived 83% longer. That's a huge change just from missing meals every other day. See what I mean? It's amazing. So, 
That's it's really amazing. amazing. You know, yeah. I got into the whole thing myself a while ago, and I was doing intermittent fasting from some other person's book that I read, where he was saying, do it two days a week. So yes. you find two days a week that you, you wake up, you don't eat anything all day, but you can then, and of course, nothing from the previous night. So you have close to a 24-hour period of time. And then you go ahead and have a light dinner at night. And you do that two days a week. Yes. And what do you thought about the different levels of intensity like that? Do you have any uh, uh, remarks on that? I think that's a fantastic way to go. My daughter did that. And I'm in Boston now, but I'm normally down in Florida. And she's up in New York City. And she did it. And uh, we were talking about that. It was very good. I looked at all the data on that. That was a little bit more difficult. So what we have learned or what research would actually demonstrate is to get the benefits, you know, the blood sugar, the cardiovascular, the oxidative stress, all those benefits that we talked about. To get those benefits, you really have to go a minimum of 16 hours. So to go 20 hours or so, that's fine. 16 hours is very easy to do. You're basically missing one meal. So I fasted this today, right? So I, last night we had our dinner at seven o'clock. I didn't eat anything after dinner. I got up this morning. You can have black coffee and water on fasting or tea without sugar or cream or anything like that. So I had my coffee and water this morning. And then I had my first meal of the day about one o'clock. So I think I got 16 hours in on that. And I'll do that several days during the week to just try to get the benefits of fasting. So that's a very easy thing to do. Like what a lot of our patients will do is they'll start with the three-day fast. They'll buy the kit, start with the three-day fast. They'll do that. And then the next week, they'll fast three days, like a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or a Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, if Friday's more of an entertainment type night. And then they'll do the three days where they're missing one meal a day, and they feel fantastic. Their energy comes back together. We have numerous uh, reports from patients that they're sleeping better, you know. When you boost the metabolism, you're boosting everything. You know, the immune system is working better. The digestive system is working better. When you get a boost in the metabolism from fasting, everything works a little bit faster and better in the body. And it's not very difficult. This is why I think we've had decent results, really good results, is because it's not that difficult and patients can do it. Well, you know, I thought it was very interesting as you were going through it because I was trying to put myself in each one of those different places. And what you're talking about is not, as you said, doesn't sound difficult from the point of view. I did want one clarification. So do you have a light meal that dinner the night before, or do you worry about the intensity of that meal or what what happens with that particular? Actually, that's kind of the start of it in a way. Yeah, I do not, though I think that's a very good idea. Basically for me, what I'm doing, and I'm not really trying to lose a whole heck of a lot of weight, but I want the other benefits is I just take that window of opportunity from one o'clock today until seven o'clock today. And that's my window of having meals. So basically I had my breakfast this morning, you know, I had eggs and oatmeal and then for for lunch, which was really just a, a, you know, a half hour ago, I had leftover chili from last night and then tonight we'll have our meal. So I don't really reduce the food at all. I just reduce the window through which I'm eating that food. So today my window was from one to seven. And then I'm, I'm going to do it again tomorrow. My daughter got married about a week ago in Nashville. So we were there. and Oh, that must have been fun. We were eating and partying oh. and everything. So I'm trying to clean up my body a little bit. So my I'm wife gonna... and I, we have some friends. We we love Nashville. We love it to death. We I won't get off on the Nashville oh, thing. Because we, we could we a talk a whole hour on that. But. So this week, I'm, I'm going to fast, you know, probably three, four days. And I don't find it that difficult because I keep myself busy in the morning. And uh, if you are hungry, and sometimes, you know, that 9, 9 30, 10 o'clock, you get a little hungry, we just encourage our patients to have two big glasses of water, give it about 10 or 15 minutes, and they usually feel satisfied and go about their business and wait until their next meal time. As you're probably aware, the brain center that calls for water is the same area that calls for food. So in many cases, we're feeling hungry and we just need water. And many people, many Americans are dehydrated. So getting more water in is always a plus. So that's one of the tricks that we do if you get a little hungry. One of the other things, there's a, um, in the kit, there's a spray. It's a combination of herbs and oils. There's a spray that if you get hungry, you, you take two or three sprays into your mouth and it suppresses the appetite. No, so yeah. it's, it's very nice during that three-day fast or as you're fasting afterwards 
to use that. But really, the water works fine for me. If I get a little hungry, I have some water and I'm generally good. Well, let's take a minute to talk about that diet. So you got my curiosity up. Let's talk about the fast start diet. If a person were to use that, now you said it kind of quickly there. Let's let's tease it apart a little bit more. So if a person then has starts, you mentioned three days in a week with a fast start diet. So that and you mentioned several selected days. Do they use that diet throughout that day? How does that actually work again? Could you say it one more time? Yeah, yeah and I didn't really cover that so well, but. So the Fast Start Diet is a box. It's a kit that you buy. And it's, I think it's $79. And if you use a doc as the promo code, you save 10 bucks or something like that. But it's a box of food that you buy. And the goal and the way to do it is to use it. Like say you're going to start on Monday. You would have Monday's food and from the box, Tuesday and Wednesday. So it's three consecutive days where all you're eating is the food that's in the box. I got you. Okay. And the food is allocated to this is what you can have for breakfast. This is what you can have for lunch. This is what you can have for dinner. Oh, I got it's, you. Okay. It's good proteins. It's good oils that the body needs. It's many soups and things of that nature. So it's not like you're having pizza and burgers and things of that nature. So it is restricted, but you're actually tricking the body into thinking that you're not putting any food in because of the combinations of proteins and oils and very few carbohydrates and that whole thing. So it's a very good jump start for somebody that wants to lose weight and get themselves used to fasting. So the way it works in our office is depending on how we just had a lady that she wants to lose quite a bit of weight in the next two months for a wedding. So she's going to do the fast start kit three days every week this month, right? So mm -hmm. four weeks in a row, she's yep. going to fast for three days. Then the next month, she's going to fast every other week using the kit for three days. And then in between, she's going to have 12 to 16 hour episodes where she doesn't put any food into her body, which is that intermittent fasting that we had talked about. So you go from like dinner at seven to the following day's lunch and you just miss breakfast. So she's going to probably hit her target, her goal for this event or function or wedding. And she's going to do it that way. But most people will use the three-day fast kit to get themselves started and then start to incorporate that intermittent fasting where they're missing one or two meals a day, several days during the week after that to get either their weight target or their energy level target or whatever they're trying to accomplish with that. Does so that the fast, Yeah, absolutely. I was just going to say, so the, it sounds like the fast start diet is a way for a person who's not accustomed to getting started with a diet using the fasting method. Absolutely. They actually break into it a little more slowly. They don't have to go dive off the deep end like I did when I was doing intermittent fasting by eating dinner and then waiting till the next dinner, which yes. is basically 24 hours. And you're saying really that 16 is, is quite sufficient. If, if 16 is sufficient, then and I'm talking about myself, but I'm sure other people are listening the same way. It's almost like if you did it three days a week, you know, like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, as you were saying, or whatever, you then would have a significant benefit. Is that true? Absolutely. Your metabolism would improve. You would lower the, you'd have better blood sugar balance, lower the diabetes risk, the type 2 diabetes risk. It would, fasting just across the board does these things. So it reduces the rust or the oxidative stress and inflammation. So you have sinus problems or arthritic conditions, you start to reduce the inflammation, you feel better good for the cardiovascular situation, lowering the blood triglycerides and the cholesterol, and then getting rid of the dead cells in the body, which is also very good. So those benefits you get from just a 16-hour fast. I think you probably get more benefits from the 24-hour that you did and that my daughter did. And she's pretty tough. It wasn't the easiest thing for her. So mm -hmm. what we were really striving for is something that really the majority of people could do Yes. I found that the three-day fast is very simple. Anybody can commit to that for three days. So that they, we were excited about that. And then if we start using the intermittent fast afterwards, where you're only missing breakfast, it's really not difficult at all. And I think this is why the results have been so good from a weight loss standpoint, because it wasn't so difficult and people could stick with it. Well, they don't have to jump off the cliff. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's like very easy. Yeah, he's like, let me work my way into this and figure out what I'm going to do because I got this habit of eating 
I have no idea where it came from. <laughs> and I want to figure out how I can get over and take care of myself. Now, tell me this. This is another question. One of the things I've been interested in is, is, is sort of a side thing is, is the whole Bulletproof guy, his name skips my right, I think it's Avery or something, right? But, but the issue is using the high octane Bulletproof, what am I trying to say? Because it's not right in the fresh part of my mind, but where you're using a type of coconut oil. And really, I'm sort of beating around the bush coming up with the whole thing of the ketogenic diet. Yes. But how does a ketogenic diet compare to what we're talking about, this fasting diet? Well, they're totally different. And I'll tell you, the ketogenic diet would be more of a lifestyle type uh, diet that you would stay on on an ongoing basis or any of these, you know, uh, where you're, you know, wheat belly, that book, I can't think of the doctor that wrote that book, but, you know, you avoid the wheat products. So there's a variety of these types of, of diets and those are great diets, but if you wanted to do that, and that was your choice as a lifestyle, but you wanted to jumpstart your body's ability to accommodate that and get better results with that, primarily in weight loss, then a good way to do that would be to do the, the three-day fast, I got jumpstart the body, yeah. and then go into the ketogenic. So we do have people that have an interest in that, patients, so they do the jumpstart and then they go over to the South Beach diet. But what we standardly recommend, because it's simple and everybody can do it and it doesn't require any purchasing of, of new items, is the jumpstart diet and then just intermittent fasting. And if that gives them the results they want, they usually are not searching for another solution. But all those things are great. The diets that you mentioned and the no wheat diet, all those things are fantastic. The ketogenic diet. Those are all fine, but if you really want to get a jump start on the whole thing, that's where the three-day fast or fasting in general really kicks it into gear. Well, let's talk a little more about that. So you mentioned 79. Was the 79 for the entire three days? It is. You get a box of food delivered to your house, yeah. and we open the box. It's a very nice presentation, too, which I actually liked. So it was easy. We knew our patients would be satisfied when we recommended it, but and it, it's very simply laid out where this is what you can have on day one. And then here's the box within a box for day two and then same thing for day three. And that coupled with increased water and the little appetite, appetite suppressant spray that's in there, which is, which is basically herbs and oils, nobody's had any trouble with the three days. And that's why people tend to do it maybe even once a month or so if they're trying to maintain a way to control their weight, things of that nature. Yeah, just get on top of it. Now, let me, let me ask you this whole thing. So what happens with somebody, you know, we see individuals who are seriously food addicted. Now, what we're talking about is, you know, myself, your daughter, you, you know, we're not morbidly obese, but right. we see people who are morbidly obese packing three, 350, 400 pounds. So what happens with a morbidly obese person who's saying, look, I'm going to die if I keep doing this. I've finally, the dawn, it's sort of like the cigarette smoker has an unremitting cough, you know? Yes. And, and they're like, I just got to do something. I mean, I'm going to die. if I. And they start to face death and they say, I'm going to do something. Now, are there any particular cautionary notes for a person who is morbidly obese rather than just somebody, a regular street person who's got some weight problems, some issues going on there? Like, I've got a serious medical problem here. I'm thinking about taking medications to help me curb my appetite. Tell us a little bit about your perspective on that, if you will, please. I will. I do not see or think that there would be any concern with that type of person. We actually do not, just for whatever reason, we don't end up taking care of a lot of those types of patients. So I don't have much experience with that. I do not think the fasting would be a bad solution for them. Mm -hmm. But they may get a better solution if they had more of a complete program. If they're really sort of addicted to food, there's a bit of a mental component to that that would need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And maybe some appetite suppressant drugs and things of that nature would be very effective in conjunction with the other things. But the fasting on a very obese person would have the same benefits that it would on somebody that's just overweight. And I don't think it would cause any risk. I don't know whether it would be the best solution because they would need more of a sustained several-year program 
And that we tend to not really get into that for whatever reason, but we haven't had a lot of those types of patients. So I don't have a lot of direct experience with that. I do not think the fasting would be bad for them, but it may not be enough of a program to get them over the hump and on the downslope. Well, it's a tough thing because there's so much further down the road. And yeah. you worry about them medically. Me as a practitioner, are we going to do something potentially damaging? I just didn't know if you had some experience with it because one would think it might be damaging to the person who's going to be more vulnerable because they've, their body is so completely beat up, corrupted, oxidized. And you, know, and you imagine the sugar, the whole thing is complete. And plus, they're so used to doing carbs. They're going to be carbohydrate people. You know, they're, they're just not going to be you know, salads and fish. It's and true, so, yes. Otherwise, they wouldn't have gotten that way. And they're going to be doing the junk food thing. So there are a lot of different elements in it. But I think it's, it's important. My intuitive sense of it would be that it wouldn't be a problem because all they have to do is have some kind of method, which you're talking about here with the, this fast start diet, to get slowly but surely into this next level of taking care of themselves. They can't, a person like that can't jump off the cliff because it's just way too much to expect, I think. Yeah, I would agree with you. It's a very steep gradient for somebody that's that overweight and obviously has a big strain on other parts and components of their body. Absolutely. So. Well, I'm going to ask you this question now, and we'll come back and answer it in just a minute after we take a break. But one of the things I think is always useful for our audience, and I know I personally like to hear it too, because all of us in listening to a guy like you who's had a lot of experience like that, wants to know what the problems are. I'm not putting you on the spot, but I mean, Somebody wanted to ask me what my problems were. I could talk a week about the problems that I've had thinking I was doing it right, you know? <laughs> so when we come back, I'm going to ask you, hey, here's what you were doing. Give us maybe a couple of examples or some particular themes that you say, this is where you meet the resistance. This is where the problem usually occurs. So we'll look forward to hearing that answer. And folks, we'll be back in just a moment. Today, the world of mind science, psychiatry, and mental health is rapidly changing with innovative, comprehensive testing that takes both patients and practitioners into a new world of measured details with useful, understandable, and remarkably actionable plans. The key phrase here is cost-effective. Testing also introduces a key parallel word, predictability. Psychiatric treatment failure, especially after multiple medications, and our brief hospitalizations arises directly from the complexity of measurable brain body imbalances and impediments that explicitly interfere with medical outcomes and create costly difficulties with inadequately informed supplement and medication trials over time. Great Plains provides a leadership team of biomedical experts with advanced laboratory insights approved nationally both by the FDA and CLIA laboratory certifications and is available internationally for both public and medical professionals. Great Plains Laboratory is the primary laboratory we've used at CoreSite for years with excellent customer service for both patients and medical colleagues. They are on the spot, they get it every time. In addition, they provide exemplary training modules, which are webinars and conferences, in an effort to broaden practice perspectives wherever you live. Do follow up on one of these complimentary test offers today at http greatplainslaboratory.com forward slash CBJ. Yeah, that's Core Brain Journal CBJ. Well, welcome back, folks. We are here with Dr. David Magnano. He's in Boston and Florida. He's got a whole range of things that he's been talking about with us about dieting. Who isn't really thinking about some of the terrible things that are going on with the way we're eating, the morbid obesity problems, the obesity problem itself. Morbid obesity is advanced obesity. But one of the things I wanted to ask David as we were talking about, and we said this just before the break, and that is the whole issue of his personal experience. What were the challenges, David, that you've seen where you're going along? And you're thinking this person's going to work out. And then you had some rude awakening. You know, you were doing this and something else happened. And you had to sort of think on your feet that the surprises that a person might expect that a seasoned practitioner like you say, hey, here are some issues. Here are some things to think about that might be a challenge along the way. 
Yeah, so uh, we've basically seen two areas. And uh, during the three-day fast, we've had some patients that just want to, in addition to the food in the box, the beauty of the box of food is that's what you're to, you're to eat every day for those three days. You have your well, first day, second day, third day. So some patients have wanted to add things to that, say some vegetables. You know, we've heard celery and carrots, you can crunch on these and it satisfies this and that, or have an apple and it's good for your bowel movements and other things. And so that's one point that we've seen. And what we really try to tell our patients is that during the next three days, you want to have as much water as you want, have your two cups of coffee or a couple cups of tea, whatever you like with no sugar and, and cream. Yeah. And then other than that, just eat the food in the box. There are snacks in the box. And if you get hungry, drink some water, use the spray, which is oils and herbs, and just do the thing in the box. Because what'll happen is you'll definitely get the results. The combination of those foods will trick the body by keeping the blood sugar in a range of the body feels that it is fasting, even though you're not fasting. So that's one component. Oh, I wanted to add an apple. I wanted to add some veggies. You know, these are very healthy foods. Why can't I do that, doctor? It's totally fine. So it's not so fine to do that. That's one of the issues. The other issues is we take care of a lot of patients that are exercising. There's not a lot of protein on day one, two, or three. There is, but not from an athlete standpoint or somebody that's exercising. So they wanted to add a can of tuna. They wanted to add a protein shake, things of this nature. So mm -hmm. we basically have, have learned through experience that this sort of screws up the fast. If you're going to do the fast, you have to do the fast. What we've told a lot of our patients that are, you know, they're doing training for a, a run or something like this is during that three days, you're going to get so much benefit from the fast that go for a walk, but don't overly stress your body with a real hard workout or a long run or just give your body a bit of a break from the training. Be active, walk and all that. Just don't overdo it because you're not replenishing all the stuff as far as protein that you may want. So those are really the only two areas. It really comes down to the people that have done best, eat the food in the box and that's it. <laughs> and, the people, and the people that come back and say, geez, you know, I only lost a few pounds. Yeah, I feel better, but it didn't work all that well. And so we dig in a little bit. We find, yeah, I had an apple, but that's a very healthy thing. But it does alter the three days of the fasting. So other than that, it hasn't. And because we, we've now, we now know that, we tell them about that. We see somebody that's actually start with and say, look, this is what's going to happen. You know, one of the things, David, I'm sure you, you're aware of what I'm going to tell you, because we see this happen all the time over in the psych business, because we can do supplements. We're very big on measuring all these biomedical contributory factors, just like you heard in our thing about Great Plains. We do Great Plains a lot. We, we really appreciate them as a company, but it's complex. I mean, if you see what's going on with your body from a simple urine test, you're like, oh my gosh, it's amazing. So then we give them supplements. Well, then they're like, well, maybe we can do this. I think one of the things that I've seen happen with a, a common theme is the smart people are the most difficult people to deal with. I think people who are not quite as inventive and creative are going to be like, hey, just let me do it. I'll get it done. You know, like they're used to, in a me in metaphorically speaking, pull the plow. Yes. But the bright people, they've always got a different way to cut the pie. I mean, like there's some, maybe it'll be celery is the way I'm going to cut the pie. Or maybe it's going to be tuna fish. Or I'm only going to have one small piece of cod. I mean, you know, whatever. It's going to be. Yeah. And I ask yourself the question. I don't know if you've, if you've separated it out. But to me... It's the creative, inventive, smart people that want to figure out a different way to cut the pie. They're going to be different. And so it's especially if that person is coming at me strong linguistically and I know they're smart, I start right off the bat by saying, look, you, you just don't try to outsmart this whole thing. Just do it. <laughs> that is so, so accurate and just so funny to hear somebody else say that. That is totally true. Because they figure, well, yeah, you got this figured out, but there's got to be a better way. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure out a little bit of a better way. And so that is funny. But the people that just want to do the program and not question it too much, they love it. They do fantastic. So, it's uh, a, and, they're, and they wind up being more successful, I'm telling you. It's a, I think this is one of the problems, just to do a quick sidebar on this, is what's going on with stimulant medications in the country. Because the whole stimulant medication thing is a complete 
fashion show, okay? Because they're judging human beings based on how they look and throwing things at them. Then everybody's got a different way to cut the pie. Because the criteria are so vague and amorphous, hyperactive and inattentive. Yes. Well, then nobody knows what they're doing. So yeah. since you don't have a clear idea of what you're doing, then look, I'm telling you, this is a way to take it. And they're like, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm going to take it this way. I'm going to take it that way. So one of the things we do is we work very, very hard. In fact, we do numbers all the time with people. Here are your numbers. This is what we're shooting at. And we do brain function numbers instead of doing fashion show numbers. So yeah. we, we do brain function in the office. This is the number. This is the way you have reported your brain is working under these circumstances. It's not a psychological test. It's like, can you please just follow the rules and tell us if the medication that we're giving you works to modify those numbers or if it doesn't? It's as simple as that. Instead of going off, I can't tell you the number of people that go off to college and, and God bless them, the pediatricians are so focused on school. Hey, well, you know, you were in school in your high school. Now when you're in college, just, you know, kind of do what you want to. You, you know, if you need to study hard, take it. And if you don't, don't worry about it. And then people wonder why there's such a stigma with psychiatric medications. Yeah. The imprecision is awesome. It's so unbelievable. I mean, it's a global plague. I mean, yeah. people are throwing meds around. They have no idea what they're doing. And they're all kind-hearted, nice people. But And I'm not blaming the physicians. And by the way, folks, I'm not blaming the pharmaceutical companies. It's not the physicians, not the pharmaceutical companies. The standard of care is, is a problem. And I know, and you know, basically the standard is, it's a dance card. Yeah. And so if it's a dance card, anybody can do whatever they want to and everybody's board certified. Yeah. So anyway, I get off the subject. Sorry to get on my high horse there, but. No, no, know, I, 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 I have to agree with you. If you can measure an outcome, it's just perfect. It's just beautiful. You can actually do an objective test to say, here's, here's what's happening. This is the way you can actually evaluate whether your therapy or treatment is working. Well, let's elaborate on that. I got off my on my high horse a little bit. Let's ask you about this. Do you actually do like a foundation clinical set of tests to see where they are? Or do you, how do you actually measure things like that that would be instructive and interesting and keep that person tied up with the program? Well, we do have people in our medical department that will get that type of testing. And a lot of times they won't come over into our side of the uh, clinic. They're not using the three-day fast as much as we use it. We're not using blood work and, and numbers like that. We're offering this just as a way to improve. I think the, you know, on the medical side, they're doing more things if they're going to be adding some some drugs, some anti, uh, uh, some appetite suppressants and yeah, yeah. things of that nature. Yeah. So then they're looking at those numbers and there may be a reason why they're doing that. Maybe it's the, the blood sugar or the fats or whatever in the blood. So we're not really doing that. Our, our criteria is basically weight loss. That's what we look at. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there's, there's factors that can skew those numbers, you know, somebody not drinking water during the fast, that's not recommended, but of course they would lose more a poundage, but not more fat at that point in time. So um, we really look at the, the weight. You, you, you really stay, your number is, is the scale improving? Yeah. And then basically we have uh, 10 or 12 questions that evaluate sleep and energy and things of that nature. And we look at that and those are totally subjective. Here's how I felt beforehand. Here's how I feel now. So there's always an improvement with that. Probably half the patients sleep better, even after just three days, which is fantastic. Everybody seems to have more energy, which is really good. And then uh, the weight loss, that's what we look at. Well, you know, I would say one thing here, and I'm not being critical, but I'm just trying to help the way you're thinking about it. I think that subjective, I think we need to remove that from the conversation. I'll tell you why. Because that, in a way, is saying there's a measure of inaccuracy because the patient is actually reporting to us what they feel. And there's yes. a little bit of a, a shot there. And you you don't mean it this way, but I'm just telling you, I do a lot of things that are subjective. Why? Because I'm a strong believer in participatory medicine. And I think you're doing exactly what you should be doing, David. And you're doing, you're asking the patient for their impression, what they feel, what they think, that makes a difference. So people say, well, it's placebo. I don't have placebo in my office. I got it set up. The person is going to come into my office 
And if they don't tell me what the problem is, then I'm not doing my job to set it up to have the conversation correctly. I'm going to take some responsibility because I'm going to, I'm going to rail them about telling me what they think is going on because then we really have participation. Yes. I, I tell them, look, guys, I am the complaint department. And if you, first of all, I'm ha always happy to hear positives, naturally. That's one of the reasons I became a physician. But if I don't hear the negatives from you, I'm not doing my job. It's as simple as that because I have no idea what I'm doing if you don't tell me what I'm doing. That's as simple as that. Yes. And, and so well, then I think people say subjective, and I think it's, it's really a very big step to numbers and objectivity by having the conversation that so many people don't have because they're practicing vertical medicine rather than participatory medicine. Yeah, and I agree with that. We, we actually have an ulterior motive to doing the subjective evaluation. We, we actually got our questions from the activities of daily living type questions that they use in our physical therapy bay yeah. uh, to evaluate you know, whether somebody's moving better and functioning better. So it's that type of line. But the other thing that I actually like is when I sit with a patient and we ask these questions beforehand and then we ask them after the three-day fast, they can see for themselves the improvement for themselves. And then we use that viewpoint, their new viewpoint, to say, okay, now it would not be that difficult to continue an intermittent fasting three days a week for the next six or eight weeks until you hit this target here which is what you had indicated you, you really would like to hit. So when you do run the risk of, no, I don't feel any better, that's true, and that works against you. But for yeah. most patients, they do indicate they feel better. And that for them, because they're indicating that, is motivation to continue on. That's sort of the way we look at it. But I would agree with you on that. Me, I like problems. I say, look, that's how I, that's how I earn my living. Yeah, I got a problem. I'm not doing something right, so I'm going to change what I'm doing. So. <laughs> I love it. Well, listen, thank you so much for coming on board. I want to make sure that our guests, our, our listeners here, get a chance to connect with you. The one that we mentioned a couple of times, we will mention again, that's the faststartdiet.com, which David does work with them and, and as a speaker for them, as we mentioned in the intro. And David, you've got another LinkedIn site where people can contact you. You want to share that with us? Actually, I do want to share that with you, but I do not know what it is. I'm sorry. Oh, I got it. That's okay. I got it right here. I, don't, I just wanted to give you the chance to say it. You know, no, it's funny. You. I don't go on LinkedIn all that much, so I apologize. I, listen, join the party. I don't know what mine is either, buddy. So, I mean, I know what it is because I can go to my computer and it'll come up. But yeah, so it's LinkedIn. So. If it's, David, is it LinkedIn.com forward slash in forward slash dr dash David dash Magnano, M-A-G-N-A-N-O. That's the connection for David at LinkedIn. Do you have a, a separate additional website, David? I do not. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, that's good. So you're cooking right there. Yeah. And by the way, folks, when you if you're in your car driving to work, over on the show notes for this episode, we have some other specific books that David has recommended for your consideration that are going to give you additional, even more peer-reviewed reference, all kinds of data on these diets and why you should think about them. I'm going to tell you right now, if you've had cardiac problem, if you've had carotid endarterectomy, a stint put in, if you've got any kind of hypertension problems, if you look at your cardiovascular equipment, if it's suffering and you don't do something like this, you're missing 50% of your recovery. I mean, at least 50%. And I think it's absolutely important to get hooked up with a guy like David and get on these programs and, and take care of yourself in a better way. So we really appreciate you coming on, David. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed speaking with you. You have a good day. We'll talk okay. later. Thanks. Thanks for listening to Core Brain Journal. We're working every day behind the scenes to bring you reports that connect research benches with those street trenches. Here we share the complexity of mind science because, as you know, details really do matter. One of the most pervasive, misunderstood challenges is how commonplace medications, like those written for ADHD, are used so regularly without clear guidelines. If you think you'd like more specifics, take a minute to download my two-page PDF packed with video links and references on the absolute essentials of how to start ADHD medications. They're easily available at corebrainjournal.com forward slash start.
Thanks for listening. Do connect and stay tuned. Together we can make a difference.